So as we look at problems, we typically look at them as something that we really want to go away as quickly as possible so we can get back to whatever else was interesting uh, on our mind. Rather than look at them as an opportunity to figure out how to make tomorrow better than today. So typically, we, we don't develop the level of understanding that we should develop. We end up dealing with symptoms as opposed to real underlying causes, and things tend to get worse rather than better. So over the decades, well, systems thinkers believe that they have a better answer or a better way. And over the decades, as people have asked me what I do, as I begin to tell them, you could see their, their eyes glaze over as I'm sure they were asking themselves, why did I ask and how the hell do I get him to stop? What, what has happened is that System thinkers, like most disciplines, have developed a world unto their own, believing that they have a better way to approach problem solving. And if you get any number of system thinkers together, whatever the conversation is, before too long, it rolls around to why isn't systems thinking more broadly adopted within the world? And typically, they never come to the right answer of realizing that th they are the problem. System thinkers are the reason that systems thinking is not more broadly adopted in the world. Ask yourself, how much of what I have to say would you be willing to listen to right after I told you you were stupid? If, if I come to you and tell you that, that the way that you have learned to think about things all your life is wrong, you should listen to me because I'm going to fix you so you can think better. System thinkers have been selling systems thinking to the world for about seven decades now. And for the most part, the world isn't buying. And the reason for that is, well, there are actually a number of reasons, but, but mostly it's because we're selling. In uh, The One Minute Salesperson by Spencer Johnson, there's a marvelous quote that says, while almost everyone loves to buy, almost no one likes to be sold. And I had developed this model over and over and over again numerous times. And it has to do with a farmer who is experiencing crop damage. So he applies pesticides to kill the insects, but he has to apply more pesticides every year. And he realizes that the insects have births, which increases the number of insects, which doesn't really completely address why he's having the problem. And then he realizes that the pesticides are creating pesticide immunity, which results in more insects and more crop damage. So he's not doing himself any services. And the pesticides also kill the controlling insects, which no longer eat the crop eating insects, which lead to crop damage. So he's got another vicious reinforcing cycle. And I, <clears throat> I developed this model over and over and over again because I think there was something that was trying to get out that I didn't realize. And what I didn't realize was how it was that I went about uncovering the set of relationships. I, it finally, I finally had what I thought was, for me, an aha moment in that all of systems thinking was distilled down to a single question. And the question was, and? So that from the beginning of this, starting with the situation, I ask, what does this influence? And what influences this? And I continue to ask the same question on an ongoing basis so that until I find completions or loops, because we've come to understand that feedback causes relationships to have the feedback more control over the way that situations behave than simply direct relationships. The seldom, well, you would be hard pressed to find any real one directional cause and effect relationships. Everything completes, even though some of them are, are intangible completions, they all complete. So with, with that awareness, with that aha moment, 
came one more piece, and that was I realized that that there was a connection between a model and a play. If you go to the play and you sit there and you see the relationships develop between the actors from one act to another, at the end of the play, you leave and you take the story with you because all of the, the relationships and things connect to create the story. And what I, when that happened, I realized that when myself and a multitude of other systems thinkers were inflicting their creations on the world, what we were essentially doing is consider if the playwright walked up to you, handed you the script for the play, and five minutes later said, what do you think? There's simply no way that you can comprehend the script for an entire play in five minutes. So we inflicted these models, which for us represented um, a great movement or a, an advancement on our own understanding of the set of relationships, but we didn't give other people a way to understand them. So what... I finally began to do was to develop these relationship models and unfold them as a story and do a develop them in such a way that a person could walk through the story. So I'm sitting at the table in the morning, I'm having a very pleasant breakfast and my wife yells down from upstairs. Are you going to finally clean up that unsightly growth around the bird feeder today? I'm getting tired of looking at it. And all of a sudden, this whole set of relationships flashes before my eyes as to how, it, how I got myself in this terrible predicament. I typically deal with a lot of frustration on an ongoing basis, and it detracts from my pleasant breakfast. Though for the past several days, sitting having breakfast, watching the birds outside on the railing has, has helped me deal with my frustrations on an ongoing basis. And after this happened for several days, I decided to install a bird feeder. The thought being that the bird feeder will go ahead and, and attract birds, which increases the birds outside, improving my pleasant breakfast. And the side effect being that the bird feeder actually adds to the attractiveness of the garden which attracts more birds at the feeder and adds to my pleasant breakfast. Then I realized that the bird feeder requires that I buy bird seed. And if you've looked at the price of bird seed, buying bird seed added to my frustration as opposed to um, the other things actually providing me with a more pre pleasant breakfast or lifestyle. And the birds at the feeder created spillage, which increased the need to buy bird seed. And the bird feeder attracted squirrels, you know, the universal eating machine, which, in, which decreased the number of birds at the feeder, which increased the spillage and increased the need to buy bird seed, which added, well, actually the spillage attracted rodents, <clears throat> which increased my frustration because I got to figure out what to do about them. And the spillage promoted the unsightly growth that my wife is complaining about, creating more frustration. And the birds are now pooping all over the railing, and I have to figure out what to do about that. And the question is, what's the real problem that I have to deal with? Well, I could get rid of my wife, and then she wouldn't complain about the unsightly growth. <laughs> or I could go ahead and and figure out how to redesign the bird feeder so there wasn't spillage, but then I still got to buy bird seed. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things that I could do, though aren't all of them actually symptoms? Where's the real problem in this story? The real problem in this story is me. The problem is me not thinking before I do stuff. It's simply looking at this from a limited perspective of cause and effect so that the birds outside create a pleasant breakfast, so I want more birds. And, and as soon as I think I have an answer to my problem, I stop thinking, which seems to be a common problem amongst people. You know, here's the problem, here's the answer, 
and I never ask about what are the implications of actually applying that solution to the situation. As Senge said in the fifth discipline, seldom can we ever do just one thing. There are always multiple implications of any action that we take. I developed a workshop. And it turned out to be the workshop that I've ever, the best one I've ever done in my life. Because I started and I said, okay, there was about 35 people at five or six different tables. And I said, take out a sheet of paper and someplace on this paper, draw a dot and label it cat. And a couple of inches away from this dot, draw another dot and label it mouse. Now draw an arrow from cat to mouse and write chases on the arrow. And then I said, you have now developed your first relationship model and you feel, if you feel faint, you should leave now. And four hours were absolutely out of control. And at the end of four hours, the entire group was absolutely amazed at what they were capable of doing because they were developing relationship models more complex than this and they were presenting them to each other. And they did all of that in, f in four hours. So it, it's not that, I mean, they proved to themselves that it wasn't difficult. And, and what it was that they found so fascinating was they learned how smart they were. Not how smart I was, but how smart they were in terms of what they really had the capacity to understand about the situations that they dealt with on an ongoing basis in a way that they never thought about them before. I actually shy away from talking about systems thinking. I mean, it's like Fight Club. The first rule of systems thinking is don't talk about systems thinking. You find some people that are wrestling with a situation and you, you ask them, you listen to the, what they're doing and how they're looking at them, and you ask them questions that they didn't think to ask themselves. The way that we go about attempting to address things, take a current situation, a desired situation, which creates a gap. We, and we don't like gap tension, so we seek to understand, develop a strategy, and go through an adoption intended to move the current situation in the direction of the desired situation so the gap goes away. In the process of understanding, more often than not, we end up with what I call scope creep, in that the desired situation gets bigger and better and, and more difficult to accomplish. <clears throat> and there's a lot of ands in here. The, <laughs> if it takes a long period of time <clears throat> to move the current situation in the desired direction of the desired situation and reduce this gap, there's a pressure to settle for less, which causes the desired situation to be diminished. It's like on New Year's Day, my New Year's resolution is I need to lose 50 pounds because I'm way overweight. <clears throat> so during the month of January, for the first 15 days, I'm really gung-ho, and I managed to lose 10 pounds. And now I'm plateaued, and, and, and I'm not going anywhere. So the pressure to settle for less causes me to desire to be at the weight I'm at so that the situation gap goes away. I mean, the easiest way <clears throat> to solve a problem is to say, I accept the things that are, so I don't have to do anything about it. <clears throat> Part of the difficulty is that we really don't comprehend the complexity and the complicated nature of the things that we deal with and definitely don't understand the separation of space and time. Um, you know, the old idea about, you know, doesn't matter where I lost my keys, I look for them underneath the lamppost where the light's better. So that because our understanding isn't what it should be, the strategy that we develop and adopt creates unintended consequences. And those unintended consequences typically make the situation worse or, <clears throat> or create new problems that somebody else has to deal with. What we should be doing is developing a strategy that actually endeavors to avoid unintended consequences so they don't happen. <clears throat> the problem is we've never figured out how to reward people for ensuring that problems don't happen. And then you end up being in a situation where 
the, the real objective is to figure out how to solve problems so they stay solved and not create new problems in the process. Is it absolutely attainable? No, but we could be better at it than we are at the moment. And while this particular diagram talks about the nature of the beast, it doesn't talk about the nature of understanding and how to go about it because it's missing a piece. The piece that's missing is the stakeholders. What seems to be apparent is that if you want to develop a solid understanding and approach to dealing with the situation, all of the relevant stakeholders need to bring their perspective to the puzzle, to the party, so that you can go through all of these other pieces and actually understand the trends and components and interactions and develop a strategy and adoption approach that actually deals with the situation. The, and the reason, the way that I came to this is just really bizarre in that one day I thought about in, in all of these consulting gigs that weren't succeeding about how often do people wash their rental car? Almost never. And the reason is a question of ownership. So if you want to address a situation and have it actually develop a solution and have it implemented in a way that accomplishes what really should be accomplished, it's the stakeholders who have to do it so that it's appropriate for them to have ownership of the situation that they're trying to deal with. I can't solve your problems. We can figure out answers to deal with the situation, but I can't. I don't think I can convince you of anything. The best I can possibly hope for is to provoke thought. Thank you.